fragments of your destiny. Could you type that in the chat, please? That is the theme for this morning. Fragments of your destiny. And I'll be delivering this word using four main points based on what the Holy Spirit has given to me. But if he allows me to subtract or add, then I am at his mercy, right? So fragments of your destiny. When I got that theme, the first thing that came to me was, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. If I'm going to be honest, I did not remember where exactly that scripture came from. But of course, only God knows more than Google. So I went over to Google and I found Second Peter 2, 3 rather, 9. And it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, ward, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. I couldn't understand why I heard, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but when I paused a little and reflected on the theme, fragments of your destiny, I recognized where the Holy Spirit would be taking me. Our, 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 our destiny is somewhat seem like it is not working out for some of us or it is just coming in pieces. But God wants to remind us that he is not slack concerning your destiny and my destiny. So remain true to his word. Of course, Jeremiah 29, 11, I didn't have to Google that one. It stood out to me and it, and it connected with the theme. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. It simply means that your destiny, your future is indeed in the hands of God. It has already been predestined. May we walk accordingly. What is a fragment? A part broken off or detached. A fragment is a part broken off or detached. I also paused to look at off. And I'm saying, hmm, fragment of your destiny. And we should know, or if we don't know, off is a proposition because it shows that a person or an object belongs to or is related to something. So you and I, we are related to our destiny. Getting that? Are you following me? Now, what is destiny? Destiny is God's intended plan and purpose for our life. I found this on the internet and it says, destiny commonly refers to a specific future or outcome that results from a predetermined or inevitable course of events. The word can also refer to the course of events itself or to the power or force thought to make much things happen. And many of us will hear the word destiny and think, oh, my fate, not F-A-I-T-H, but the F-A-T-E, my fate. But for me, when I thought about the word destiny, I believe it is God's blueprint for our life. Like, simply put, his blueprint for our life. We often ask the questions, what, what does our destiny look like? And if we stop to think about it, I want you to literally pause right now and think about what your life has been like from the moment you can remember, I wouldn't say up until birth because you perhaps don't remember, but perhaps your parents or your guardians shared with you what you were like at birth. Take a minute and, and reflect on that up until this moment, even the moments which are difficult, the moments which you would consider misfortune. Think about them very briefly, very, very briefly. I often tell my students that history happens every day. I like reading some things. <laughs> I like current affairs. I like being in the present. I like history. And if we look at the happenings just leading up to us, especially as black people being liberated, it was movements taking place bit by bit, 
those movements I would call fragments. Fragments taking place for us, persons fighting for us, some of the humanitarians, some of the very slaves fighting, putting the pieces together so that today we can be liberated. If we reflect on Jesus, and we will a little bit, if we reflect on the life of Jesus, we will recognize that Oh, he didn't just suddenly go to the cross and die. But there were different pieces that were put together. It simply means that God had a blueprint for Jesus' destiny. And ours is no different. It seems fragmented, but it is all working together for our good. When I think about my life, I think quickly, okay, I, I grew up in Alps. Alps Trelawney, and everybody should know that. I'm an Alps girl. I talk about Alps a lot. I like where I'm from. I just believe Alps is the best thing in the world, right? Hands down. No debate. Let us not talk about that. All right. Now, my parents, Jennifer, Desmond, I shouted, out, shouted them out earlier. Uh, they have been there. I was born in Spalding Hospital. I'm not sure if I said that earlier, but that's where I'm from, partially. I have a brother, and I'm the first of two. Mommy perhaps feel a little way if I say this, but mommy, a part of me sharing is like, I have to share because your destiny is a part of mine. It's intertwined. Sometimes mommy will say to my brother and I, I don't know how it work out. Perhaps them two fit me that will me lose because she had miscarriages. I wonder if them are really better than your Mara because the tone sometimes really not make no sense. <laughs> and she would say that. But the fact of the matter is, God knew that had to happen and my brother and I are the best things ever, best persons ever to my parents. So, so though the miscarriages took place, it didn't change the fact that, hey, it happened. It's a part of the journey. It's a part of her destiny, her life as to what would have happened. Now, as I grew older, I, uh, I was about mm, grade four, whatever. Sometimes I told, this, I told, sometimes ago I told the story about what happened. I'm literally trying to remember the exact time. But like I say, it is whatever. The, the important thing is that at a point in primary school, I would have believed been robbed a little of my dad. Robbed in the sense of he went to prison, right? It's no nothing that is hard to talk about these days. Actually, it's a part of what I've embraced because if you know, you know that I totally adore my dad and I have seen that fragmented part of my dad help him to become a better man and help me to even be more understanding and attached to him. That's a part of it. it some person may say, but how, oh, how? Oh, that doesn't make any sense. That's some detrimental thing or happening in your life but it happened now another thing in my life would be that after daddy went my mother was there like true general she she was there present time for me to go to high school and she was very much present she did all she could life was rough though life was hard at the time i couldn't see that as mommy struggled sometimes to find a school fee or she struggled sometimes to make sure that we have something to eat i couldn't understand but no i recognized that it was a fragmented part of my destiny that i've grown to appreciate that i've grown to, to to understand how to be compassionate and connect with people on different levels i also recognize that before my wedding Mommy and I didn't have the best relationship. We, 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 we were somewhat torn. But a few days before my wedding, my mother and I got to a state of vulnerability. We cried. We cried. I thought mommy didn't like me, and then I, I thought I wasn't going to like mommy. But that moment when we broke down to this date, all I can see is passion and love for my mother. My mother is like one of my best friends now. All I can see is that. But though leading up to that journey felt painful and detached, again, it was an important part of the journey to my destiny. Because now I can connect with people. I can tell people like who are, who are not connecting with their parents, are not making their parents priority to say, hey, no, don't do that. Reach out, do what you can. 
It's an important part. I got married to Gavin Lee Hamilton. That's a part of my journey. I think I was about 21, 22. I was a little girl, young-ish, you know? And he said I was 23. Okay, so I was 23. At the time, I, yeah, I was in love, and you don't know what a clock has struck. You just go on. You understand? Good man, love God, and yes, you can't take that. But now, in marriage, you're experiencing the test. Do I regret getting married? Certainly not. Do I regret the hard times? I used to. But maturity and growth in God has allowed me to recognize that, no, they were important, or they are important, all the tests of times. I don't need to look over another marriage or another fence. Remain. And if, the, if God says, do this, do that, but remain steadfast before him. I am 36 years old, and I am learning now. I want you to trod with me. We're going somewhere. Now, after I got married and you're there, I started teaching before I got married. So I'd have taught at Waterford High School for about 11 years, 12, I'm not sure. Perhaps Miva is online. Lady Miva can tell me. I'm not very good with dates sometimes, though I'm a historian, the irony, right? So after that, I would have been there, served, did my best, did my degree, did my master's at Shorty Teachers College and UA respectively. Now I am a lecturer at Shorty Teachers College. Why am I saying all of that? All of those things that I could remember, some of the things I have left out, Lady Cardine would have said some of them when introducing me. But the fact of the matter is, all of these things together have come to together to make Nakita a person, make Nakita a woman, make Nakita not just any woman and any person, but a bold representative of Jesus Christ. When you reflected on your journey, how did you feel up until this point? How did that make you feel? But the truth is, while all of those things are, are good, some of them, I have come to recognize that the fragment of my journey that I've grown to appreciate the most was when I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. It may sound cliche because you're saying, oh, that's what I'm expected to say. I'm a Christian, I'm a minister, I'm all of that. But that's not so. I got saved and baptized at a crusade. I was in grade six. One of those things, I can't tell you that I understood everything, but I don't regret like literally, I am happy that I was able to grow life. The journey certainly wasn't perfect, but I didn't give up on God and God has certainly not given up on me. As we go through this message, I want you to reflect. God is going to pull some persons from some hurt and some pain and some regrets and some shame. And he's going to allow you to stand resolute and boldly to do that which he has called you to do. Turn your Bibles with me to St. Mark 14, 27 to 31. I'm going to be looking at the first point. The first point that is important in this fragmented journey we are on. And it reads, you will all fall away. This is Jesus speaking by the way. Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, even if I fall away, even if all fall away, I will not. Truly, I tell you, Jesus answered today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emph emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. Now, the first point is that Jesus knows your propensity. Jesus knows 
your propensity. And your propensity has to do with your natural inclination or your natural tendency, the way you behave. Everybody who interacts with me would know by now that I can be dismissive, I can be loud, I can be fun, I am a stickler for some things, I believe in excellence. If any of my students are watching, I will rub them to the T because here what you are not supposed to fail, you are supposed to do well. Now Jesus was telling Peter and the disciples here that here what? You are going to deny me. Peter said, no. How can Peter be telling Jesus that, Mark, you know, he is telling Jesus that I am not going to do what you are saying. The one who knows all things, the omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient God. How is Peter saying, no, no, God, God what are you saying? No, no, back up, back up. What are you saying? You don't know. When he already knows our propensity. He knows it. Now, when you think about the leadership body here at Pure in Heart Ministries, Prophet Ryan Light knows us. He knows us. He knows that Minister DJ will pray up a storm and then Minister DJ will perhaps go into our mind and, and think about something a little deeper. He knows that Minister Giselle is going to come and say, but sir, I don't quite get what you're saying. Do you think... He knows that I'm perhaps going to be the one who will ask a million one questions and, and I will be there and say... That, that don't make any sense. And he knows that Minister Daniel is going to pull up our calendar. I think we should get our, our dates and structure together before we move on because we need to have a vision of, of where we're going so we don't fall behind. And Minister Jessica is going to be like, oh, yes, what, what we're saying sounds good, sounds good, sounds good. Mm -hmm. uh, and she'll just say, what, what will the hard care team do? That is going to be our sense. Minister Neville is going to be there. And I say, Minister Neville, Minister Neville is going to say, Prophet, Machosio. But one thing, um, do you think we should do an audit of X, Y, Z, D, 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 and Minister Gavin is going to say, sir, okay, it doesn't sound so bad. It, it doesn't sound so bad. If Prophet Ryan can take the time to know his ministers, if you ask me about my team, Spirit Wisdom and Pure Evangelism, if Lady Shanique is watching, I'm sure if we log on for a meeting, Lady Shanique is going to, then we're done already. No, man, we're done too quick. Come on, cha cha cha, and then you're gonna have Lady Carita just come on, and she's gonna be there. Okay, Minister, she's gonna start the meeting. Any other thing you wanna say? And if Lady Mishka is missing from the meeting, everybody's gonna say, "What is wrong with her?" If you go over to peer evangelism, I'm gonna be tired of Lady Fedora and Lady Sheena just bickering at each other. I'm gonna say, "Like, I'm done now. I'm tired now. I'm tired now." We are confident of the members that are under our core or our care, rather. If we, if your boss, if the people you serve can know you, imagine God. Imagine God. So we don't need to come and be fronting up with God. He knows what we can, will not do. He knows our good ways. He knows our bad ways. He knows all of that. No, Jesus knew that Peter was impulsive, ambitious, self-assertive, and quick to commit without even fully understanding God's word. That was Peter for you. And I want us to take a minute here. Take one minute. Have you been hiding the fragments that you are not proud of from God? Or have you been trying to hide? Because the truth is, you cannot hide from God. Are you saying, no, this, this car is uh, it's too much. It's too much. Are you saying that, God, I don't like how I sound. I don't like how I look. Are you saying all of that? God is saying, I can use anything. I can use the things that seem as though everyone has rejected to give him glory and honor, to reach the unreachable. Am I saying that you are supposed to stay in your bad ways? No. And as we get a little deeper, we'll realize that Peter indeed recognized that he had to become a little less uncouth. Like myself. When I, when I, by nature, like I said, I can be abrasive, I can be aggressive. Have I learned? Have I come a far way? Have I been submitting to the will of God and sometimes rather than speaking, you shut your mouth? 
Yes, because it is what God wants. Is there a time when I know that the, the, the propensity to stand up against injustice and to be bold about God, that I am there? Yes, yes. So God is not saying, if you are born a natural leader, if you are born a natural chef, if you are born a natural homemaker, and sometimes you don't get it right, God is not telling you to do away with it. God is saying, submit to me, my child. Submit to me. Because the things that you think are bad, Peter's nature to be impulsive and arrogant was not readily accepted but when God, Jesus didn't give up on him Jesus took his time to sharpen Peter to sharpen Peter and he refined Peter are you following me are you following me make sure that you are following me again I don't want it to stick to the thing that is there so misty and so may I go, may I go stay no that's not it if you are filled with pride, if you are filled with anger, if you love keep malice, if you love man and you love Walipa woman and them something there, you know, say, it is not the way of God. And when I say love man, you know what I mean, in excess. Because as a female, you must love man. And as a male, you must love woman. I mean the excess. We get that, right? Good, good, good. We don't make the excuse to say we were born in sin and shaping iniquity, so it's okay. Note that he, according to Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work in you is faithful and just to bring it to completion. My life is a testimony that God can take the areas of your life that are uncouth, to refine you, also to know when to use it. Submit to the will of God. The second point to note is that if God says it so, then it is so. If God says it so, it is so. Type that in the chat. If God says it is so, then it is so. Amen, amen, amen. Let me take a look. Yes, yes. If God says it's so, it is so. Let us read St. Mark 14, 66 to 72. Remember before we read Jesus telling Peter, not asking, telling Peter that you are going to deny me. And Peter said, that is not going to happen. I'm too loyal to do that. While Peter was below in the courtyard, now Jesus prayed and he had prophesied that Judas would betray him. Judas would sell him out. So when the, the, the soldiers came for Jesus, Peter, they fell asleep in the garden, of, of course. Peter, Peter had hurt. Peter had, Peter, Peter bad. You understand? Peter just said, you know, go away with Jesus and him just chop off one of the high priest's ears, right? Baps, done. When he finally got to the courtyard, let us read. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter war warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with the Nazarene, Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about. He said, and went out into the entryway. Remember, no, you know, Peter said he would never do this. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again, because the girl said, no, me sure. May I have them not play a trick for me. Me sure. Me not see doubles. Me sure is you, me see. I me know me see a cut off the man. Yes, me very sure. No, she, he said, standing around, all right, following, I don't understand what you're talking about, he said, and went to the entry. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow is one of them. Again, he denied it. So one, two, let us go to three. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. 
he began to call down curses and he swore to them. I can't imagine Peter. I don't know if you see it. Anybody ever said it? I take God off of the cross. I say, I take God off of the cross. I never do it. I never did it. And some of you are wicked and lie. You know, we're dear. You know, we're present. You know, no. So this is Peter. Peter all call down curse from the people. Him. Oh, you must call down curse and you know you were dear. You better keep your mouth quiet. Peter get into him feelings, but remember, you know, Peter, nature is like that. Let us continue. Immediately, the rooster crowed the second time. The, then Peter remember. So the first time and the second time, he didn't remember that Jesus said this was going to happen. But he said the third time, one conviction come upon Peter and not take it light. Hmm. Let us go. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. Oh gosh. Oh my God. Oh my God. The first thing, if God says it so, then it's so. I don't want it to be the second, the third. I don't want you to, to just have selective dementia, amnesia. If God tell you, say, I saw, I saw. Can you think right now of some promises that God has made over your life? You, you, you don't see it coming to pass just yet and you feel like you want to forget. You, you feel like you want to forget that God has called you to be the head and not the tail. It seems like you want to forget that God says, I am going to make a way for you in the desert and the wasteland. You seem like you want to forget that you will know no lack. Do you want to forget that? If God says it so, then it is so. If God tell you, say, don't go down there. Because if you go there, you're going to buck your toe. No matter what things say, when you go down there, you're not going to buck your toe. He said it. Then it is so. No. <sighs> My mother, I may speak about her every now and then. She's comical. Those of you following my WhatsApp story, you'll know she's something else. Sometimes she'll pause and she will look and say, Boy, Nakita, we're gone, but a man in really can't come good at evening. Is it that she is saying that because the damage has been done already, there is no hope for redemption? No. Many of us may know that proverb, and a grandmother, somebody must have said it to you. My mother was telling me that, Nakita, don't lament on that which has passed because God is able to. If he said it, so it's so. But, and we're going to go there a little bit uh, later. But from Mark 14, 66 to 72, Peter, we saw him earlier affirming his loyalty his determination, his resolution. And he said that he would never deny. But the fear of men came upon him and the weakness of his flesh overtook him. Have you ever been in that place where the flesh just, just is like, you say, when I go to work this morning, all of this lady provoke me, I am not going to answer you. I am going to walk away because I have power over the flesh. And you are trying now, you all out just morning and then you go to Brahms afternoon, you are going so good. But then you see by noon, no noon, evening there about, the flesh, the flesh gave way. And you find yourself saying things or thinking things that you shouldn't have. Have you ever been in a position and you said, Lord, I am not going to fornicate. I am not going to commit adultery. I am not going to tell any lies. But you just find that you were pushing and trying, but the flesh, the flesh. And sometimes we have to to recognize what these things are. Not sometimes, all the times. We have to recognize what they are so that we can stick and honor the word of God. 
When Peter recognized, and this is what I love, when Peter recognized that he was wrong, what did Peter do? Now type it in the chat. When he realized the third time that he blundered, when he recognized the third time, said, oh no, I really denied Jesus. What did he do? He wept. He wept. And, I, and when I was reading the Bible, it's, it's, it's as if I could feel the weeping. It's as if I could imagine myself at the altar crying out and say, God, how did this happen? How? Why? Some of you are in your spaces now and you're, you're saying, God, I'm fed up, I'm tired. I'm tired, so I'm going to just do this, I'm going to just do that. You know you shouldn't have. But if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, if the Holy Spirit is your convictor, you just know that you cannot just, just, just walk about so and feel like all is well. You are going to go before God and you are going to weep. You are going to weep. As Peter did, he wept before God. So yes, you wish you didn't engage in these activities. You wish that you didn't have to go through the divorce. You wish you didn't commit abortion. You wish, you wish and you wish and you wish and you wish and if this, if that, it gone better ready for joy. It can't come good at it, but I did it, it gone, it gone, it gone, it gone, it gone. Do not allow the enemy to keep you in a place of bondage. And know that we are online and we're not in the, in the regular space where we could reach out to each other and talk to each other as easily and connect. And, and some of the things of the world seem and feel more alluring. But God is saying, my daughter, my son, stand. If God says you can, then you can. If God says you can overcome, then you can. You will and you must in the name of God. Jesus there are some things that we don't have any control over so like some things happen to us some some of us would have been molested some of us are are victims to different things and we don't have any control over it and we're saying God but why did you allow all of this to happen it's a fragmented part of your destiny yes why did I not have my father? Why did my mother have to die? How is it that I am at this place? God, why are you doing this to me? For a moment, can we not just see our destinies as something that happens only after we've died? But in this moment, in this moment, it is a part of your destiny. This moment, hence the fragments, it's putting together to make a whole. You can't just do everything one time. So the pain and the hurt and the happy moments and the hurrah moments, yes, they are beautiful. And you wish that they did not violate you. But can you think that you are able now to heal someone through your pain are you recognizing that you are able to walk a young lady a young man step by step with the help of the Holy Spirit and give them hope yes you can so I ask you do not bask in your regrets just stick to the word of God and know that if he says it is so then it is so when I got to this point I don't think she'll mind I'll say her name she's fine Lady Ashika when I got to this point I remember uh, she sent a voice no literally I didn't remember the happening until she sent the voice note, asked her permission to share with the leaders, and I did. 
But the voice note was so reassuring because it took me back to the moment when she came. Uh, we were by 80 and she came and she said, Minister, I need to speak with you. I need to speak with you. And we went into the, the, the room and she started sharing. She had a major decision to make and she, she didn't feel like God was working it out. She didn't feel like she was seeing the way. But the voice note that Lady Ashika sent, those of you who know, know she's in China. She sent the voice note sharing that on that day, which she ended up in China, was a year later to what had happened and where she wanted to go. And she said, Minister, remember I was bawling. I was crying. I didn't know the what nor the how, but I was crying. But you know what Lady Ashika did that helped her to remember? She documented it. She wrote it down. So when she literally flipped through her journal, she could see that whatever the date was, that this day God did it. She said that I said to her, you will look back a year from now and you will realize that God has shifted you immensely, that you, you'll be amazed. And she was indeed amazed. I want you to pause again. There are a lot of pauses because you have to reflect. Whatever is happening in your life right now, if you are going through financial woes, all of us, my dear child, all of us, God can, he will, and he is going to. I didn't plan to share this, but I remember our last PhD experience in the building. Prophet Carter called out for persons who um, can sow a seed. I don't remember the story leading up, but the essence of it is he called for persons to give $50,000. At the time, I had like $200 or so into my account. I only had that. And I went up there, you know, I was I put on a piece of balling. People would think he's wicked or wicked to the Lord or God do something. But to the way I was crying is because I said, God, this is a sacrifice. And I want you to prove that you can do it. And when Prophet Carter said, by the end of the week, you're going to find it. I never doubt. I never know from whence forth it would come. But I kid you not. <laughs> Oh my God, I kid you not. By the end of the night, $50, $55,000 came to my account. You hear what I say? If, and when I saw it, I never ever bother with no wally for itching, because you know the devil I have a week. It's not, you have a lot. If you don't have $200, there, you have so many things to do. You have gas, you have, you have to live. I never bother itch. I sent it. Because I've proven God. That is just one. I've proven God. Even in my lack, even when my account had anything down to zero, 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 point zero, I know the God I serve will come through. So no matter what it is, trust God. Trust him. Trust him. He will bow before him. With a sincere heart, that is what I know that God saw in Peter. It was not just any ordinary crying where you just go to the altar and you cry and you get up. No, it was a weeping to say, God, forgive me. Some of us have to weep and say, God, I need to see the way making part of your show up in my life right now. Cry before him, he will respond. The third point is that God restores. He restores. Come with me to St. John 21, 15 to 25. I'm using my regular Bible. It's sort of easier for me to read sometimes because it marks up and all these things. So St. John 21, 15 to 25. When I, when I got the point, God restores, I was like, God, this is so cliche. Why are you saying God restores? But then he said, like, that is what I do. That is actually what I do. You don't need any fluff. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, no, by this time, I like to give you a little context. By this time, um, Jesus died, rose, and this was his third appearance to the disciples, right? So Peter wept and he 
was in deep regret. How could I deny Jesus? How could I not stand up for him? But it was all a part again of Jesus's destiny, fragmented part of his destiny in essence. Let us go back to the scripture. So it is St. John 21, 15 to 25. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon, Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time, I can imagine myself <laughs> getting irritated. Like, why are you asking me this again? I told you this already. Like, this, th th don't ask me that again. You know, hear well. I can imagine myself. So Peter was getting a little, you know, edgy. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time. No, this felt like Peter was saying, because I denied you is as if I'm going to have to be living in this forever. You asked me once, you asked me twice, and you asked me a third time. Why are you doing that? So he was so broken. Do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Reading this part, I could feel growth in Peter. I don't know how to explain it to you. But I could feel growth from the time when Jesus said to him, you are going to deny me. And he arrogantly said, no, I'm not going to do this. He answered. Even when he felt hurt, answering the third time, he said, Lord, you know all things. By this time, Peter recognized that Jesus knows all things he didn't realize when Jesus told him he was going to deny him but no he is saying you know all things all things you know that I love you Jesus said feed my sheep very truly I tell you you when you were younger you dressed yourself and went where you wanted but when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. I would read the next part, but we can't stop there because it really captures the essence of it. Follow me. Peter went from denying Jesus three times. And again, we can imagine the agony when he recognized that he didn't stand up for Jesus. Jesus who has been restoring him and shaping him and building him. You could just imagine. But Jesus came back from the grave, went among the disciples, spoke to Peter. He never tell him, talk to anybody. He spoke to Peter and he asked Peter, do you love me? I'm going to ask you, do you love Jesus Christ? Do you? Or are you basking in the idea that I go to church, I'm a part of pure in heart, I love God, or I get up and I pray, do you truly love God? Because note, Peter recognized that Jesus knows all things, but for restoration to truly take place, there has to be a true connection with God. There has to. At the third time, we saw 
Jesus said, follow me. So with all the mess, with all the fragments of hurt and pain and sorrow and bitterness and unforgiveness, God is able to restore you if you are willing to love him as he should be loved. If you are willing to submit to his commandments, if you are willing to heed your ways and submit to his ways. God is asking you, do you love me? And if you can answer that from a genuine place, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what is happening. I charge you that Jesus Christ will say to you, follow me. I charge you that Jesus Christ will say to you, follow me. Jesus helps us to overcome our fears. John 4, verse, 1 John 4, verse 18. Media team doesn't have this one. Whether stepping out on a boat onto a tossing sea or stepping across the threshold of a Gentile home for the first time, Peter found courage in following Jesus Christ. Peter found courage in following Jesus Christ. And so too can you because perfect love drives out fear. Some of you are fearful that, oh, I cannot walk this Christian journey. It requires too much. But can you submit to the love of God so that he can tread with you day by day, so that he can surround you with the people that you will need to undergird you and carry you through. Can you do that? Jesus forgives unfaithfulness. After Peter boasted his fidelity and he, he recognized that he denied Jesus Christ, Peter pretty much burned his bridges or was just in a way of trying to figure out God. But Jesus didn't give up on Peter. He did not. Jesus lovingly restored a relationship with, with Peter and the other disciples too. He rebuilt and he restored. So even in your fragmented state, God can rebuild you. God can restore you. God can. I remember when we went to Woman Thou Art Loose, there was a, a preacher, doctor, I don't remember her name, but she gave such a good example that it, it stays with me. You know, broken glasses or broken, imagine having a, a bowl that is made of glass. And it, it falls to the pieces. It falls and breaks into pieces. Naturally, you cannot put that together again perfectly. No, you cannot. But the example she gave was based on Japanese art. King Suji. And it is the art of putting broken pieces back together. And King Suji literally means golden joinery. Do you know what happens? If Minister Deidre is online, she'll perhaps remember this. When the broken pieces are put together, they are more expensive than they are in their normal or natural state. And I say, but it have to be. After you go through all of those pain and brokenness and all of that, there is no way you're going to value the same like when you were just born you are going to recognize that the value on your life has increased. So instead of dumbing down yourself and basking in brokenness, own your brokenness, stand with Jesus because Jesus is close to the brokenhearted and recognize that your value has increased. You are not just the same. You are up a notch. Walk like you're worth a lot. Speak like you're worth a lot. Know who you are in Jesus Christ because the potter has 
done it. The potter has been forming you. The potter has been putting the fragments of your destiny together so that you can be whole for others. So you won't see a clear, smooth surface. You will indeed see the patches. Don't hide your scars. Submit them to God so that you can truly heal. Now, the final point is your fragment, all of your fragments will help to leave a lasting legacy. Lasting legacy. Sometimes when we think of legacy, we just say we have to dead and gone. You're just dead and gone. And yes, you want when you die for your name, your work, to live on. But the fact of the matter is, I believe in getting to that. Don't wait until you are dead. Do not wait until you are dead. Your fragments will touch spaces that you didn't know or imagine that you would be able to. Your life is there to move beyond you so that others can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior so that others can indeed be healed and rejoice in him. Jesus doesn't specialize in using persons who are uh, heroes. Yeah. He doesn't specialize in that. You and I, a local girl from Alps that he continues to mold, a little girl from Alps who recognized that no matter what, no matter the brokenness, no matter my uncouthness, <laughs> there's not such a word, but yeah, no matter all of that, he is able to put me together, increase my value, and so too he can do that for you. You may be unschooled, you may feel like you're just ordinary, but God specializes in those. We can use Prophet Ryan as example, high school, there. But God has been using him to touch lives. If God can do it, for Prophet Ron, your some of you are online can testify to this, then he can do it again and again and again and again and again. So in closing, if you're trying to figure out the puzzle, all the pieces, all the brokenness, the loneliness, the hurt, the separation, the anxiety. If you're trying to figure out all of that, don't do it by yourself. Trust God. Trust him. Submit to him. When I was driving over last week from work, another story I didn't plan to share, but hey, I, no, it wasn't work. I went to the hairdresser to get my hair braided and I, I didn't like it there. But anyway, it was time to come over. And when I was driving, my body went back to a place of anxiety. Uh, prior to that, I don't remember the exact time, but... I was driving the other vehicle and um, I testified once that I, we lost, I lost the, I was driving by myself, so I lost the brake going down the hills of, 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 not the hills, the hill or the incline rather of Yui there. I was going to visit someone in the hospital and there was no brake. I panicked, but I didn't panic for long. For some strange reason, I... My default is to call on God. So I called on God and he responded by sending someone to 
to help me literally carry me over. And then another time after that, I was driving on Port Henderson Road and I literally felt the car going back way. But in that moment, I was in traffic and I was in traffic and guys, Nothing on this earth could not tell me. It's like I went back to that moment when everything felt like it was going wrong with the car. I had to pause. Tears running down my face. And I had to start declaring the word of God. I even had to remind myself and the vehicle that this is a 2023 car. Not, not do it. You just got it. It is fine. I had to pull up the handbrake, put it in park. It was like I was having a whole ordeal. You couldn't tell me that I wasn't going to crash in somebody or somebody wasn't going to crash in me. So when I'm saying these things, I'm not saying that it will be easy. I'm not saying that you won't have flashes. I'm not saying that the, the fragments of brokenness and hurt won't come back to you. It is not easy. But I got home safely. I drove after that. You know why? I took some deep breaths. And I said, Jesus, you are my anchor. You are my shield. My mind belongs to you. Nothing, no one shall tell me otherwise. I will not become fearful of driving. In the name of Jesus. So wherever you are right now, remember that God knows your propensity. He knows who you are, what you're capable of doing. You don't need to go back and be telling him and to be rehashing it. What you need to do is to submit everything, the good and the bad, so that he can work on you. The next thing is remember, whatever it is, if God says it is so, then it is so. If God is warning you and showing you the danger signs, do not. Do otherwise. Take heed. You don't want to end up losing your life carelessly. You don't want to end up losing your self-worth and your self-esteem carelessly. So if he says it so, heed. And the flip is true. If he has spoken, not if, he has spoken positive things over your life, stand on them. If you're at a place of brokenness, of feeling like you have disappointed God and there is no room for redemption or, con or you're condemning yourself. God restores. And with all these fragments coming together, God is going to make you leave a lasting legacy. Lasting impression in the life of a young lady, in the life of a young man, in your church, in your workplace, in your community, among strangers, he's going to allow you to do this so that someone will carry it on for you. Someone will tell another story about someone who has helped them. Stand firm on the word of God. Be resolute. Be vulnerable before him. Be true to him. In your spaces right now, I encourage you to create an altar. Create an altar wherever you are. We're going to be praying.